my friends. It's your old pal Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said well. We're coming to you from just outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and today we're going to be exploring some of the home and the sad ending, the grave of the great songwriter Jim Croce. Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. Yes? Hey there, bad, bad Leroy Brown. You ready to go see Jim Croce's house? We're gonna start out here at a, uh, a farmhouse that he rented back in 1970 with his wife Ingrid. There's the man. If you take a look at this corner, you'll see there's a historical plaque sign and a farmhouse behind it. The sign says, Jim Croce, songwriters, Hall of Fame inductee and singer. Croce was best known for upbeat urban ballads and songs about the common man. It's like time in a bottle, bad, bad Leroy Brown, you don't mess around with Jim, an operator, topped the singles music charts, propelling Croce to national fame. A two-time Grammy nominee, he wrote many of his most successful and timeless songs in the farmhouse nearby before his tragic death in a plane crash. That nearby house is right behind this. Wow, is this cool to see. There was actually a documentary that came out in 1973 of Jim and his wife and their newborn son <laughs> right here. Actually, I believe it was up on this porch down at this end and the camera was pointing that way. Jim's talking and Ingrid's talking and this was, this was their house from 1970 till 1973 when they moved out to San Diego. This was a an interesting relationship because they were both really good musicians, Ingrid and Jim both. They met that way. Uh, he was 19 and she was 16 at a hoot nanny in 1963 and they started dating. He was off at college part of that time at Villanova and three years later, they ended up getting married when she was 19. And one of the stipulations for his wedding present from his parents was they gave him money to record an album because they both loved music and they were kind of hoping that if the album failed, they would give it up. Now, while he was at Villanova, he was in a band and did work on music there. And then when he and Ingrid got married, they started performing together for about four years all over the East Coast. Now they ended up moving here because they had lived in New York and they were basically based out of the Bronx, writing songs and performing, and they just weren't having any luck. So they came here to where it was much cheaper to live. Jim could play some of the local places around here and he would play pretty much anywhere. He didn't make that much money. Never really in his life did he ever really make any money in music. The whole time he was alive, he had made a bad deal in New York for people to promote him and every time he played a show he, he barely made any of that money. But while he was around here he would basically play like juke joints and kind of like what you would see in the Blues Brothers movie behind Chicken Wire or just around a rough crowd where he really had to have his wits about him. But he loved playing music. That was really what it was all about for him. So he ended up having to supplement his income by doing construction jobs in the area and driving a truck. And a lot of those people and hanging out with those people after work were, would be where his stories came from. A lot of the hanging out at the tattoo parlor, going to demolition derbies and things like that, that's what he would write his everyday life about. So once they lived here for a few months, Ingrid told Jim that she was pregnant and, uh, and that gave him a whole new lease on life because since he had made the bad deal, he was kind of not wanting to do music. He, for about a year, he was kind of stagnant on it 
he felt like anything that he created or earned was going to go to someone else, so he just wasn't inspired. But once he knew he had a child coming, he would start performing pretty seriously and um, put out his so first solo record. Had quite a few hits with that and started hanging out with a lot of famous people here at this house. None of those people would be superstars yet. It would be people like Jimmy Buffett, Arlo Guthrie, uh, James Taylor, Bonnie Raitt. They would be regulars here and his wife would say that Jim was a real people person. Everywhere he went he liked to make friends and it wasn't very uncommon for him uh, to not bring home some stranger. She said it was pretty often that, you know, they'd have three or four different people that had completely different jobs, completely different values, different ethics, different lots in life. And he would love to just see how they all interacted here and would often let them spend the night and stay here. Now his band was basically him and Maury, his guitar player. They had started out where Maury was the singer and Jim played guitar and then they swapped roles and they would live here with both of their wives at the same time because they were touring so much together eventually that just kind of made sense. Jim and Maury would end up being on the road constantly, but it was once Jim found out that he had a child coming that he sat down and wrote some of his most um, popular hits like Time in a Bottle, um, Operator, Photographs and Memories, Don't Mess Around with Jim, all those would come while living here. And Ingrid said they loved it here, you know. She said that they entertained a lot of friends, smoked a lot of pot, had a lot of laughs, made dandelion wine here, but most of the time he would be touring for long, long stretches. Like, he would do 300 shows a year, so she said once she had the baby, it was pretty much, she felt like it was just basically her and the baby here while Jim was out on the road and she just couldn't understand. He would play show after show, be gone for so long and still be making about the same amount of money he was when he was working around here for next to nothing. Jim loved this place though. This was a real retreat for him. When he was home, he was always inspired here. Like I said, he wrote a lot of songs and one of the times that he came back, she said they had an argument and the next morning he had slept in the basement and had spent the night writing I have to say, I love you in a song. And uh, that was a beautiful song. It really shows the incredible songwriter that he was. But they left here in 1973 because they just felt like they needed a change. And they ended up moving to San Diego. And Jim ended up deciding that he was pretty much done touring and that he was, even though they had moved in here when they were, he was 26, he was now 30 with a child and this just didn't fit the lifestyle anymore. So they moved to San Diego and he decided that he was just gonna stop the touring and try and find something else. Music just, the music business had not been kind to Jim even though he had numerous hits in those years. Anyone up for some wine? I really love seeing this because it really shows what an everyday guy he was. You know, when you hear the songs and you just kind of wonder who was really writing those, what it was all about. You see this and you know that it was a real rural lifestyle. So like I said, they made a documentary while he was still alive and he's talking about his life and he's standing down there and the camera is kind of pointed, you know, kind of that way, looking down the porch. So at the time they moved in, they didn't have the whole house. This was, they had an apartment in the house. Now I believe it's all owned by one person. But yeah, Jim would have done that interview for the documentary right up here. So great to see this is still here. Wow. Just about anything you ever read about Jim or documentaries, they always talk about his time here. So now let's head out and go visit Jim's final burial spot and we'll talk about what life was like for him at the end and then how it all sadly ended for him. I also just love looking at this place and thinking about all those late night jam sessions he would have had all those years with all those friends of his here, being the social man he was. So this is a double win. In order to do this vlog, there was nowhere to park near the house, so I had to park at the post office. You can see the house is right over there. 
parked the post office and went in to get something so that I could park here and I've been looking for these for about a month and a half the Giving Tree Shell Silverstein stamps it was meant to be so Jim's grave is 20 minutes almost exactly from the house So some of Jim's most famous photographs were actually taken on that property, but I couldn't see any of them from the street and they had signs that said no trespassing, so I wanted to respect that. But that famous one from his album cover where he's basically looking out the window of the outhouse that was on those grounds, I just couldn't get a good shot of it with my camera, I'm sorry. We found his grave out here though. So right beneath this pine tree, it's the final resting place of Jim Croce. I always thought that his son's name, AJ, was based off of his name, and it wasn't. I think it was. I think his name's Adrian James. Jim Croce, 30 years old, had two hits in the top 10, and right after his passing, they released "Time in a Bottle." And that also became heavily played. So Jim wasn't making any of that money. Like I said, he, they moved to San Diego and he had just, in his exuberance to have a career in music, he had made bad deals and was just not making any of the money. So he was basically gonna do one last tour and then quit touring. And one of the dates happened to be his last date to Natchitoches Louisiana was actually something that he was supposed to have played a year before for $750, but he had lost his voice. So he promised them at his earliest convenience he would come back and play that show. So by the time he came back to play this, he was actually a big star. And this was a much smaller place than he was accustomed to playing in this past year of his performing. And he honored his word, came back and gave him just a fantastic show and then was supposed to catch a flight to Texas to play another gig and then he was going to basically finish up the tour and go back home to San Diego and live with his family. Now it was sad because his plane crashed leaving the Natchitoches airport and I recently vlogged that. It was reported that at liftoff it hit some pecan trees and crashed and basically killed everyone on board. The pilot, um, Jim, Maury, and four others. But once I post the vlog, you know, I, I had read that what ended up happening was that the pilot had had a heart attack upon liftoff. And some of the people commented and said, yeah, he was, apparently he was sleeping and it overslept for the flight. And when he woke up, he couldn't get a ride. He was staying at a hotel like a mile away from the airport. So he was trying to run to the airport to get there as soon as possible and he was in his 50s and he was a little heavier set and everything and apparently that all contributed to the flight investigation said that he had a heart attack so that all was wrapped up in that and his wife Ingrid said that she was asleep and got a phone call from Jim's stepmother saying she was watching the Today Show and saw that there was a plane crash and his wife said Jim's dead isn't he and she said yeah everyone had passed 30 years old and never got to see the he got to see some of the success on the radio but he never really got to see the financial success and his wife ended up fighting to get the fair deal that he should have gotten to get the rights back to his music and what an amazing body of work to leave behind for such a short career. You know, most of what we know him for is the stuff that he did from 70 to 73. So that's yeah, an awful lot of amazing, memorable songs to cram into such a short time. And it was showing no signs of stopping. You know, who knows if he would have decided to write for other people or only record and release it like that if he wasn't going to tour. But he was... Like I said, at the time of his passing, he had songs on the charts, so he was, his f career was at an ascension. And then Time in a Bottle, which is probably his biggest hit, 
would come out after his death and it's an amazing song a song that he wrote for his son when he found out that he was going to be a father he'd never really seen himself like that he never really saw that section of what his life could be so he really had to start taking his life seriously and ended up finding out what was important for him rest in peace jim croce i wish we could have seen some of the outbuildings out there at his house because there's like i said there was the photo of him in between the brick wall was taken out there his family photo was taken out there with his wife and kid when they're sitting on the chair and then that famous one from his album cover that it looks like a church window but it was actually an outhouse window rest in peace jim jim's legacy lives on though his son is a really talented performer plays piano and the songs of Jim Croce are still played heavily on the radio to this day and uh, the songs are timeless. I think when you listen to them they just they have that feel. I mean it's kind of like the history of American music all wrapped in one. He would use ragtime and jazz and blues and country and folk and everything together to make his sound and what beautiful songs they were. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time. Have a great night and goodbye.